Have you seen what's happening in your sanctuary lately? Join us right now for another episode of Your Sanctuary, a program that highlights what makes our National Marine Sanctuary so special and the people that keep them that way. Welcome to another episode of Your Sanctuary. I'm Paul Michel. The ocean gives us so much. We often forget how important it is to our survival, from the air we breathe to the foods, medicines, and mineral resources all over our blue planet. The ocean provides jobs, supports our nation's economy, serves as a highway for transportation of goods and people, and plays a role in national security. Protecting special places like marine sanctuaries is critical to ensuring our prosperity. This episode focuses on the transportation of goods across oceans and how this is one way we are affecting the world ocean and your sanctuary. We will also get a special look at the deep ocean, a place often impacted by marine debris. Joining me in the studio today is Dr. Andrew de Vogelaire, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary's Research Coordinator and Chief Scientist. Thanks for being here, Andrew. It's great to be with you, Paul. You know, you did a great video on the lost container issue. Let's check it out and we'll come back and talk a little bit more about it. You've seen them before. These large shipping containers traveling on semis down your local freeway or perhaps being loaded on or off large ships at a port. We may take it for granted, but international shipping is essential to the global economy. And many of the goods you buy have been in a shipping container at some point. International shipping has exploded in step with the world's population, particularly with those industrialized nations that have seen a recent economic boom, such as China. At any given moment, there are approximately five to six million containers in transit. Considering almost a half a billion of these containers are shipped worldwide annually, it shouldn't be a surprise that more than a few are lost at sea every year. The question is, what happens when they do? Dr. Andrew de Vogelaire of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and Dr. Jim Berry of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute had the unique opportunity to begin to answer this very question. Well, in uh, 2004, there was a a large ship moving containers from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Uh, they hit a storm and 15 containers from their ship fell into the sea and to the bottom of the ocean. One of them was found on the seafloor by a research group seven years later. This provided scientists with the unprecedented opportunity to visit a shipping container that had been resting at almost 4,000 feet below the surface for seven years. Well, we're very fortunate at the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary to have a partner called Embari. Um, they use engineering to study scientific questions in the deep sea, and they're out there just about every day. Um, we're one of the few, few places in the world where uh, there's this much research activity, and we have maybe one of um, six organizations in the world like Embari that can operate at these deep depths of 4,000 to 15,000 feet. Um, we access the container with what's called a remotely operated vehicle. It's about the size of a car, it's a big robot, and it's attached by a cable to a mothership that's a very sophisticated piece of equipment. In the control room of this, uh, the mothership, the Western Flyer, it really looks like a NASA operation. There's so many TV screens and so many people involved. On the remotely operated vehicle, there's sophisticated equipment, uh, high definition cameras to take video and digital stills. Um, there's also a mechanical arm. There's actually two mechanical arms for picking up organisms very lightly or pinching them hard and, and breaking rock. And so um, we can take uh, pictures of organisms and we can also collect them and bring them back to the surface for study. We can also take sediment samples with this remotely operated vehicle. You know, when we uh, were heading off to, uh, to study this container, the main question is, what is the impact of it? Um, does it matter that these containers fall into the deep sea uh, regularly and that they're going to be sitting down there for hundreds, if not thousands of years? So we have this opportunity to study this one container and see what the impacts are to the organisms and the ecosystem down there. 
So Dr. DeVogelaire and his team tried to answer these questions by looking not only at the fauna and sediments around and on the container, but also areas away from the container, as a baseline was needed to detect any effects the container may have had. The first obvious finding was that everything that uh, was underneath the container when it landed was immediately crushed. Uh, we've also seen that the ecology of the area around the container is changing. So there's a local change to the ecosystem. The, some snails are attracted to the containers. Some predators like uh, crabs and octopi will hang around the container. And so there's a different dynamics of species that are being attracted to it and then being fed upon. Um, we also have some uh, thoughts that the, uh, the container might actually be changing the sediment size and the organisms underneath the sediment because uh, currents uh, move different size uh, sediments differently and the container changes the flow of the deep sea currents. With a half a billion containers being shipped annually, the numbers lost at sea very wildly due to the fact that it is not mandatory to report container losses to all relevant management agencies. You know, the, the most common estimate that's used for lost shipping containers is 10,000 per year. Um, the uh, World Shipping Organization has come up with their own estimate more recently of about 600 containers per year. And in the European Union, they talk about 2,000 lost per year just in European waters. I think the truth is, is that nobody really knows, and that's something that we would like to firm up by working with all our partners on this project. Some may think that if there were 10,000 containers being lost at sea every year, surely we would have found dozens on the seafloor already. Well, not necessarily. Shipping containers have been lost at sea for a long time. Um, they've never been detected before and studied because there are very few people that are actually exploring and looking around in the deep sea. Many of us are familiar with uh, scuba diver depth projects and even those are very localized to the near shore and in certain areas of the coastline. But very few people day to day look in the deep sea and so not only do we not find containers, we know very little about the organisms living down there. Uh, well, we were interested initially with uh, just the impacts of this one container in the one place. But when we learned about just the, the huge number of containers that are being shipped around the world in ships and in trucks all the time, 90% uh, of everything we buy and sell is moved in these kinds of containers. Uh, we thought that the question might be more interesting than that. If the ships are following regular routes from one port to another, and then regularly containers fall off, <clears throat> these containers might be creating stepping stones in the deep for organisms to move across the oceans or from one port to another. So that's one of the hypotheses we'd like to test with our study. So what can the shipping industry do to better protect themselves and the environment? Uh, some of the opportunities for making uh, uh, the shipping business safer are standardizing regulations and how you lash down the containers, uh, standardizing how you, um, uh, if you weigh the containers or not before you put them on the ships so that the ships are well balanced or, or not overloaded. And those are things I think the industry uh, wants to help make better uh, for their industry. Um, I think the industry is also becoming aware that um, a lost container is not just a financial loss, but it's impacting an environment we know very little bit about. And uh, the industry is also a lot more interested in firming up or trying to come up with numbers that we can all agree on on how many containers are lost every year. Compensatory fees paid by the shipping company responsible for losing this and other yet undiscovered containers within the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary will not only help support future monitoring of this shipping container, but also a myriad of habitat restorative projects helping the sanctuary's mission to understand and protect the marine ecosystems of Central California. So Andrew, we're seeing some video of the lost container. Can you uh, tell us what we're seeing here in this video? Well, it's a, a shipping container like um like all of your viewers see going up and down the roads behind trucks and on trains and traveling on big ships. It just happens that this is one that fell to the bottom of the sea 
Um, and it's one of the, uh, it really is the only shipping container in the world that's being studied in the deep at this time. So it looks like there's some critters growing on it. What, what, is, what is that? Yeah, well, um, you know, you can see right there that, that tall yellow thing. Those are actually a stack of eggs uh, from some snails that are attracted to hard substrates. Uh, you can see the shells of these snails scattered along the, the seafloor, and what's happening is they're attracted to the container, but there are crabs that are hanging around the base that are eating them on the way over there. So we have a, uh, an interesting community on this uh, shipping container, but it doesn't really match what we see in the rocky areas nearby. It's very distinct, um, probably has to do with uh, some of the toxic paint that's within the, the, uh, you know, the mixture that they paint on the container. So it's almost like a little miniature ecosystem there. There's probably prey and predators, you know, all on that and around it. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. I mean, that's one of the, uh, the things that um, we're thinking about as we develop questions and hypotheses about this container. You know, what is the impact on the deep sea community? And, um, you know, obviously it crushes everything it lands on. And then different organisms gather around it, feed around it like they wouldn't uh, in other areas of the deep. So we find a different types of species down there interacting differently. And we might be thinking because there's so many of these containers dropping down in the sea that they're actually like stepping stones for organisms that don't live on the muddy bottom. Uh, th they can travel from one container to the other as, they're, um, as they sit down there for many, many, many years. And how long has this container been sitting there? Oh, this container has now been sitting on the bottom for 10 years. Um, you can see that there really isn't that much growth on it uh, for some things that's been down there for that long. You can see that the container's in pretty good shape. Um, we thought it might be bursting open by now, but this could be down there for hundreds or thousands of years. And um, they just keep falling in, so they're building up down there. And you know, through time, there's all these time capsules sitting on the seafloor of everything we buy and sell. How many times have you visited this particular container? All right, we've been to this container three times since, it's been, uh, since it was originally found by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. So um, first, we assess the condition of the container, um, you know, physically, what's the structure like, what's living on it. And then we looked at it for all of the, the toxicity around the container. It finds out, turns out that these little chips of paint are in this halo of about 30 feet uh, around the container, and, and we're studying how that's affecting the organisms that live in the mud. And we've also been down there to, uh, to just study what some of these creatures are and how they interact around the container. Uh, we know so little about them that uh, we're finding these new associations, new species. Um, one of the good things about losing containers is it gets us to focus some of our attention down there and see that, wow, there is this beautiful sea life in the deep. So if this were just a big rock, would we see different community there? Do you think there's something um, special about it because it's a big hunk of metal? Right. Well, that's a big question that's uh, discussed a lot uh, about sort of the artificial reef question. Um, and I think that what we're seeing here is different than what you'd be seeing on a rock. Um, but uh, we actually went out yesterday and um, put out an experiment in the deep. And we had these mini containers we painted with the, uh, uh, the regular shipping container paint with zinc in it, this new environmentally friendly paint, and then these uh, little boxes that were made of granite and those of sandstone. So in a few years, we'll have that exact uh, answer for you. Wow, that's great. So when are you going back to the container? And are there any more studies you want to do right there uh, in that particular place? Mm -hmm. Well, we want to uh, you know, follow up on this, uh, this small uh, container experiment where we have five replicates of all of these, these different uh, types of bottom to see um, you know, how the organisms respond to what might be an artificial reef versus a stone. Uh, because we're concerned, you know, you know, in, in all of your work, when someone wants to put in an artificial reef, there's years and years of study. Somebody might like it for diving, but it might be bad for the squid that lay their eggs there. Um, so it's probably not a good idea to randomly drop these all over the seafloor. So we want to get at that question uh, about how the containers with different kinds of paint would respond and, um, you know, have just a better understanding of the deep. So we're looking forward uh, to going back there. Um, we want to 
to study our little experiment with the different kinds of containers and different ways they were painted. And we also want to go back through time every five years or so to see what the condition of this container is. It looks pretty solid. You can see a little bit of white there. Um, that's some bacteria that's seeping through where there are some cracks in the container. Uh, so every five years or so, we'll go visit that container. That's great. Andrew, thanks so much for being on Your Sanctuary. This is just so fascinating. Joining me now is Dr. James Berry, Senior Scientist with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, or MBARI. Dr. Berry is here to share with us a fascinating look at another deep ocean environment in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. You know, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the deep ocean, which is why the work Jim and MBARI does in the deep ocean is so important. Jim, welcome to your sanctuary. Oh, thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. First, uh, remind us of the mission of Mbari and the background of this particular mission. Sure, well, Mo Mbari is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, established in 1987 by David Packard. And he had this idea coming from Hewlett Packard business to put together engineers and scientists, two very different cultures, to try and address some important problems in ocean science that are limited by technology. How can scientists help define some of the important questions that might say, gosh, if I just had this whiz gang to, to measure this particular thing, I might be able to make a significant, significant advance. The engineers are there to say, sure, I can build that for you, and off we go. That's great, so you recently took a trip out to Sur Ridge. Where is Sur Ridge? Sur Ridge is about 20 miles west of Mo the Monterey Peninsula. It's on the, what is typically the continental shelf down to about 200 to 600 meters deep at the most. And it's a large ridge that rises up from the bottom. It's about, I think, eight miles long, and it's about, uh, oh, half a mile deep. The bottom of it is about 1,200 meters, say 3,000 feet or so, and the top of it is about 700 meters deep or about half a mile. Okay, so we've got some incredible video from Sir Ridge. Let's take a look at it now, and oh, you, can, you can talk us through what we're seeing. Oh, sure, I'd be happy to. Okay. Well, the first thing we're seeing here is something, a group of clams. Well, you might think this is a bunch of clams just sitting there that you'd normally find on the seabed, but these are very special clams. Most clams that we eat, uh, that we get in the market, make a living by filtering water past their gills. And as they pump water past their gills, they exchange oxygen, and they also catch all the crud that's in the water, and they sort of separate out the good stuff and swallow it and spit out the rest. These clams are highly specialized. They are not feeding on plankton as the rest of the clams are. They actually put their foot down into the sediment and take up a compound called hydrogen sulfide, sort of the rotten egg production, or the chemical you might find in rotting eggs. And they use that to fuel something called chemosynthesis, just like photosynthesis, except it uses chemical energy. And they have symbiotic bacteria in their gills, and they basically farm bacteria in their gills and then consume the bacteria to make a living. Um, so is this a rare find, and, and would you expect to find these here? Uh, this was something that was somewhat surprising to me. This is up near the top of Sur Ridge, and there must be some methane being produced in the seabed, either old methane in the rocks that are there, and as many of you know, there is um, lots of oil deposits in the rocks locally, and that methane can be modified by some microbial communities to produce hydrogen sulfide that the clams then exploit to feed their bacteria. It's highly specialized. It only can happen in small little nooks and crannies. Probably that location and why they're grouped there is because that's the only place the sulfide is available. We call these cold seeps to distinguish them from things called hydrothermal vents that we've all heard of. That's really cool. So what would eat these clams there? Uh, well, there are a number of predators that could eat them. I know that some of the larger crabs that are crawling am around are happy to eat them. There are some small snails that are capable of drilling through their shells oh, and, wow. and, and going ahead and feeding on them. Well, let's look at some other video, too. Okay. Oh, well, this is something called a vampire squid. And uh, during one, the end of one of our dives on the Sur Ridge, we were just starting to bring the ROV up from the bottom and lo and behold, we ran into this baby vampire squid. And I'm not sure what a normal baby vampire looks like, but this is about three to four inches long. Normally these animals as adults can reach about a foot long. And this one was uh, one of the first I think we've seen. Um, I typically work on animals that live on the sea floor, so I don't see lots of these because we usually zip right to the surface. 
But we got a good look at this one and collected lots of video that we've handed over to some of the midwater biologists at Ambari. Pretty exciting animals, very primitive animal here in terms of cephalopods. Oh, and here we have a pair of uh, crabs, deep sea crabs. This one I think is called Paralomus. Um, and the reason you see them together like this is probably not because they're fighting, but rather this is a female and a male. The female is the white, and the male is just holding on to it and will mate with it as soon as it finally molts. Um, crustaceans, like many uh, shelled animals, will shed their skeleton and then grow a little bit larger and then re-solidify their skeleton, and that's how they become larger and larger each time they molt. And they can breed most easily or perhaps only after a female molts. So he's waiting around for that nice uh, ripe time when they're, all the conditions are right, a nice romantic evening. So if you're a deep water crab and you find a mate, it's best to hold on to them. I think so, I think it's a good idea. We saw during this particular cruise lots of pairs or mated pairs of this particular crab. And I believe that's what's going on. And I, um, I think once the fertilization occurs, then the male will let go and the female's free to go about her business and brood the eggs. Here we have what's called bubblegum coral on the walls of Sir Ridge. These walls are black because they're covered with a manganese crust that slowly develops over the surface of exposed rocks over really hundreds of thousands to millions of years. I think the rate is somewhere between one millimeter thickness of that black crust over about 100,000 to a million years. These corals grow quite slowly, they're very fragile, and so if, if they're trawled or even if the ROV gets too close, it can break the skeletons and basically tumble over one of these large trees. And flying through here, you might think of this as sort of flying through the, the Muir Woods or one of our, our uh, old growth forests because these are untouched um, forests of corals that have been there for anywhere from probably hundreds to maybe even thousands of years in some cases. Now how big are these cor corals um, we're seeing here? These corals get anywhere from about a meter tall, I believe these are, to a couple meters or even a few meters tall. So um, say on the order of five to ten feet tall and on, in terms of age, they can be probably anywhere from 40 years to several hundred years old at that age. And this one is, this particular rock is dominated by bubblegum coral. There are lots of species of coral in the deep sea. Something we, we sort of think about as a shallow water organism. Corals are colonial animals and on coral reefs that we go scuba diving on, they feed on on zooxanthellae or photosynthesis occurs in small symbionts that live in their coral cups and they need sunlight to produce um, sugars and other metabolic products from photosynthesis. That's how they make a living. In deep water, corals live under blackness in cold, dark conditions and there is no sunlight to fuel photosynthesis. So they make a living out of marine snow that's drifting past, sort of like the little white dots you see there is marine snow that is organic debris falling from the surface or phytoplankton or other planktonic animals that they will capture and consume. So was it rare to find these corals on Sir Ridge? Well, we explored Sir Ridge um, as part of an exploration that uh, Dr. Andrew de Vogelaire from the sanctuary and I have been talking about for years and it turned out that I had an extra dive day and we decided to run over and take a look at Sir Ridge. I expected to find a mud-covered mound and instead we found these steep cliffs with these beautiful coral communities that are highly diverse, lots of fish, lots of corals. You can see that yellow sponge in this particular shot, which is we call a goiter sponge. That probably lived several hundred years as well. Completely unexpected, very high densities of coral and just a beautiful coral garden in many areas on the, on the ridge. It, it was one of the more spectacular places I've been diving on this coastline. You can see in the background some small cup corals, those, and there's another crab, another, a few crabs there. It's a, a very rich biological uh, community that we find there. So in this deep, dark, cold ocean environment, what are some of the adaptive strategies organisms have to be able to survive here? Oh, that's an excellent question, because it, try to put yourself there, Paul. It's completely black. You might see, if your eyes were attuned to it, some bioluminescent glows here and there, and you can't 
really see any changes or rather feel any changes. The temperature is mostly constant. There's less oxygen than you'd certainly find at the surface. And how do you even find your way around? Well, you're having to feel your way around. You're having to sense your way around. Chemosensory abilities or the ability of some of these animals to smell their way around to find food is probably one key resource. Using some sort of defensive structure to make sure that if you're a coral living there for 400 years, how do you keep predators from coming up and climbing on your trunk and, and eating all of your tissues? Um, you might have some defensive chemicals that you produce in your tissues to, to to uh, dissuade some of your predators from chewing on you. Um, finding food using some sound, because sound does travel quite well. There may be some way that you can use sounds that or, or currents flowing past. Um, it's uh, a different environment than any human has ever become accustomed to. Very, very specialized adaptations, yet there's lots of life there. This is so exciting to see this environment in a place I think most people would think there'd probably be nothing in this deep, dark, cold ocean. Are there plans to go back here in the future? And what additional studies would you like to see uh, here at Sur Ridge? Well, we're quite excited about the opportunity to go back. We have now made a couple cruises to the area this past year. And we have set up some small experiments to look at the growth rates of corals, perhaps our ability to transplant corals into some areas that may have been damaged by trawling. And uh, we have also marked some corals just to go back and see, well, how fast are they growing? How fast do they change? And we will go back in about uh, two years. We're planning an expedition. Next year, we're planning to go back with a mapping vehicle so that we can get a high resolution map of the entire ridge so that we can see just exactly what the shape is and where the animals live on top of this ridge. Great, it sounds like another date on your sanctuary TV to have you back. Oh, it'd be a delight to come back and give you an update about the exciting things happening out on that ridge that are just below the surface, but we don't know they're going on. Yeah, Jim, thanks so much for being on your sanctuary. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on your sanctuary TV. We've learned a lot about the shipping container industry and containers lost at sea. We also learned about a container we're studying to better understand this important issue. And we explored a remarkable and beautiful deep ocean environment at Sur Ridge. Many thanks to Ambari for their expertise to get us to the deep ocean and their knowledge to help us better understand your Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary.